Thank you for joining. Our next session is titled PKI for IoT Security. I'd like to welcome to the stage John Grimm from Intrust. John Grimm is the Vice President of Strategy and Business Development at Intrust, an industry leader in enabling trust for critical information and business applications. John's 25 plus years of experience in the information security field began as a systems firmware engineer building secure cryptographic key distribution systems. He has held leadership roles at companies in multiple areas of cybersecurity, including identity management, networking, PKI, cloud encryption, and key management. Please welcome John Grimm. Hi everyone, my name is John Grimm from Entrust, and I'm really glad to be joining the Encryption Consulting Conference this year. Thanks a lot to Puneet and the team for having me on um, and uh, putting me in the spot, you know, given that it's baseball season or finishing up baseball season. Uh, batting in the second slot is a great honor, so I, I know Puneet's gotten on base and I'll try to advance him along as the number two hitter. I'm going to talk today about PKI for IoT security and some of the things you need to consider if you're thinking about what you need to do in IoT security and the important role PKI can play and how you can apply some of the lessons of the past in PKI, of which a lot of people have had trials and tribulations with PKI over the years. So that's what we're gonna dive into today. I'm gonna to hit a little bit on the current state of the state in PKI, uh, in particular, um, how that can apply into the IoT and some of the key use cases for the IoT. I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the top security considerations that you need to think about um, when you're thinking about IoT projects and use cases key security needs and where and how PKI can be applied to those. And then how to watch out for some of the pitfalls that, that, that can hit your IoT projects and set yourself up for an IoT project success. So in terms of the state of the state in the IoT, 2020 and 2021 obviously have brought things that many of us never anticipated. What has stayed true, however, is that the benefits and the potential business benefits of the IoT have, consider, have continued to be confirmed. Its ability to help companies enter new markets, increase profits, deliver new lines of business. These have been the promises of IoT for many years. And while it's taken some time to come to fruition, those that have forged forward and, and had successes have seen these exact benefits start to come true. Now, in the last couple of years, the, the impacts of COVID-19 are undoubtedly in place. 50% um, of projects by many measures either slowed down or got stopped due to it. However, the, the glimmer of light in there is that another 25% or so moved forward and were accelerated because of the, the benefits that the IoT could offer. So there's still challenges. There were still some, some slowdowns as, as companies shifted to uh, enabling rem remote work and other forms of hybrid work. There is still a lot of good progress being made. One of the common themes, however, is that security continues to be a challenge, uh, both from the perspective of including it in proof of concepts and making sure that it's built in um, to starting to implement full lifecycle security uh, as an IoT project rolls forward. So those are some of the things we'll talk about today. As everybody knows, there's a very wide range of device types that are being uh, communications enabled today. Um, you know, starting in the, in the home environment, you have um, all sorts of things from Alexa to uh, the next generation of Roomba, which can avoid the operational problem of, of dog poop going around. You've got Ring, um, enabling end-to-end -end encryption in their devices and really demonstrating the difficulties between usability and security when security features get enabled. You have um, environments like medical devices where IoT devices are advancing the ability to provide care and provide care in new ways, whether it be medication administration, whether it be um, surgical procedures being performed by, by robots, IoT devices. And then like in industrial applications where robots can provide tremendous efficiency, safety, consistency into those, into those areas uh, and speed as well. And then some real exciting developments in areas like autonomous vehicles where uh, cars have been sharing 
data for many years, but now we're starting to get into the era where B to X, vehicle to vehicle communications, vehicle to infrastructure communications are taking that next leap and enabling a new, a new whole new world of, of safety uh, and of features that will benefit the end users. And of course, in the transportation area, whether it be passports or phones or applications, many places where the IoT is providing convenience, ease of use and, and entry into new areas. It doesn't come without challenges. Uh, now with all these devices, many of them are outside the traditional firewall that, that enterprise teams are, are used to dealing with. So they don't have the physical protection of the past. Many of them aren't designed to provide their own self-protection, whether they're outside that boundary or inside, um, aren't designed with security built in from the start. So it's a whole new wave of attack surfaces that get exposed with connected IoT devices. Also, quite a bit of diversity and complexity. Uh, the enterprise environment of, of PCs and servers and cloud platforms providing a relatively constrained set um, of, of, of operating environments that you need to worry about. Well, not so with the IoT, a lot of different operating systems, a lot of different chipsets, a lot of different variations um, on, in the platform that need to be accounted for in assessing the security design and how it fits into your overall security infrastructure. Compliance and controls, we're starting to see more legislation that is, that is at least prescribing a very basic level of security for IoT devices, not nearly to the level it needs to get to in order to be, um, to be more comprehensive and in, in keeping with a lot of, of enterprise security policies, but yet it's, it's, it's starting to address some of the basic things like hard-coded credentials, like knowing what software goes into a device, like updatability, these things that are crucial um, starting points to providing better IoT security overall. And then certainly, if you look at the environments, um, IoT um, projects are often envisioned for very large scale, not just thousands or tens of thousands, but millions of devices producing a lot of data. Um, clearly, there's a strong need and a place for automation, automation of configuration, automation of security uh, properties uh, that can't, just, can't be done manually. It won't be practical to do them manually. So clearly a real game change and a game shift in terms of, of the environment for IoT. It's useful to break down the overall environment into a couple of, of core use cases. One of them thinking about people that manufacture IoT devices, and then one of people that are more the operators or the users of IoT devices. If you think to the manufacturing side, one of the key pieces in place there that has to be in place there is supply chain integrity. How do you inject a unique identifier into that device when it's manufactured um, so that when the eventual recipient of that device receives it, they know that they've received a genuine piece of hardware that was manufactured and properly and loaded with the right piece of software. The manufacturers themselves can benefit from strong controls in this area by ensuring that it, when they're using third-party manufacturing, that they can use cryptographic controls and injection of, of identities from, from PKIs, um, from, from HSMs that back PKIs, that you can limit the number of devices that are produced. So you can keep your, your um, offshore operations in control and from manufacturing devices outside of hours or outside of, of specification. A big thing that's important there too is secured firmware and software delivery. You know, how can you ensure that the right load at the time of manufacture is performed. And that provides a basis for ongoing updates going forward if there's a, a good infrastructure in place for managing, authenticating, and checking the integrity of future software updates when the user gets a hold of it. Um, transferring ownership you know, from, from that, the manufacturing area to the operational area. All these things are, are key considerations uh, when you consider that whole chain of trust um, for an IoT device. And as an operator, you pick up at some point, you know, needing to know that the integrity of that process has been maintained. Now you've got to, in your environment, put a trusted identity into that device, enroll it into your system, and have an ability to authenticate it, to update it, and importantly, to protect its data on an ongoing basis. 
the whole point of an IoT project is collecting data and doing something useful with it. So you have to have a, a trusted setup so that you, you can trust the data that the device is producing or receiving from other devices and, and, and bringing into your IoT platform. Not every environment will be IoT friendly. Um, the, there are environments where you can't make a lot of changes and you need to, to introduce mechanisms to um, watch over, to monitor operations. You might not be able to install agents on devices, but you may be able to put monitoring in place. So it's whatever is, is uh, necessary in your particular environment to provide lifecycle management, lifecycle update, and a strong security infrastructure throughout. Some of the things to think about, another perspective besides the manufacturing and operations perspective is to think of it in terms of three core areas of, of needing to, to have strong security, and that's devices, data, and identity. Uh, first of all, if you talk about identity, or, sorry, data, as I mentioned, right off the bat, the whole point of an IoT project is to collect data and do something useful with it. So if you cannot trust the data, all the rest of it is, is just a science experiment. So having um, crypto mechanisms in place that, you, that are leveraging approved standards, known standards, uh, accepted standards is really important. Um, a lot of attention typically gets paid to confidentiality of data, particularly in environments where there's sensitive data. But integrity of data is also important, having mechanisms that can ensure that you're getting the right data. In a manufacturing environment, if you can modify a, a temperature setting that's usually around 10 degrees to be 100 degrees, you can set off an alarm that'll shut down operations and, and really um, cause that environment to come to a halt, which is a big issue in manufacturing environments. So it's not just about protecting the data. Maybe that 10 number isn't particularly sensitive, but the integrity of it is particularly sensitive. Access control, the, those encryption mechanisms and data protection mechanisms have to work together with your identity and authentication mechanisms and your network security as part of a well-concerted policy. And you have to account for the data uh, when it's being collected, where it's being collected, where it's being aggregated, and how it gets between all those points. Not always as easy as it sounds. On the devices front, you have to think about all the different interfaces and protocols that your devices might use. It's not often just one, it can be multiple. Uh, what is the sensitivity of that data? What's the connectivity, both in terms of time periods of connectivity, and again, what protocols are used? How is trust handled? Is trust implicit or explicit? What are the authentication uh, rules that are in place that need to be enforced? And of course, the ability to update a device. You cannot secure any device that you can't update. So because there is, there is no software ever written that will not possibly have a vulnerability in it. So the ability to update is crucial to ongoing security. And then finally, on the identity front, uh, the ability to provide not only unique credentials, but credentials that can be cryptographically verified in a, in a manner of in a trusted manner uh, based on your system security policy and your needs. Not only taking to, into account the device, but any user of the device. In some scenarios, it's just the device itself. In some scenarios, there are the users of the device themselves. That all has to hang together and pull back to a root of trust. So let's talk a little bit about threats for a minute. Um, this is some data from the 2020 Global PKI and IoT Trends study that uh, the Poneman Institute conducted on behalf of Ventrust. And a couple of the interesting findings here were when we asked, this was a pretty significant survey. So it's close to 2,000 users uh, globally, 17 different regions and countries represented. So it's a pretty good representation. And these were all people that qualified in as a result of having IoT projects. Um, the number one threat, altering the function of the device. Um, so you know, we saw this a lot with the Mirai botnet. Uh, there was a lot more awareness after that of this ability to wanting to change the software payload of the device after it's out there in the field. Uh, this was viewed as the top threat. One of the ways that you can counteract that threat is to have a secure uh, update mechanism for your device but it's not always as easy as it sounds. And we'll dig into that a little bit more in a minute. Controlling the device remotely was the second highest 
Now you can, you can have some funny scenarios. There were some sample attacks that were done on robotic vacuum cleaners where the, the camera was in the, in the robotic vacuum was compromised. So if you think about it, a, a potential thief could use it to case your house. So that's a little on the funnier side, but on the serious side in the manufacturing environment, control of a device remotely could have serious safety implications. If it's a, a manufacturing robotic arm, obviously in the automotive area, controlling a, a car remotely has some serious safety potential impacts. So that one came in number two on the on the, the threat list. And again, it's something you need to think about based on the device and the environment that it works in. Using the device as a network entry point, um, this is perhaps an underestimated issue. Um, many folks, when they're asked, you know, how many how many entry points they have into their network that are IoT devices, they think it's a pretty low number, five percent or low. But some recent surveys have indicated that up to forty or forty five percent. Uh, of network access points today are in fact IoT devices. So that number has grown past what many people might realize. Um, and many of those devices not being designed from a security perspective, not being designed uh, to, to defend themselves. It's not, it's not the uh, goal of the remote attacker to connect to the internet enabled coffee pot and brew a cup of coffee. It's to use that as the jump point into something much more interesting on the corporate network. So again, an important threat to not underplay. And then finally, data capture, particularly for devices that are in uh, sensitive environments. You think a lot about healthcare environments, you think a lot about financial environments when you think of particularly sensitive data. So contrast that, if you will, with some of the, what we're seeing in that same survey as the most important IoT security capabilities. So not surprisingly, you see device discovery, um, because again, you can't, you can't secure it if you don't know it's there, uh, and you have to be able to discover all these access points in order to hope to secure them. So device discovery was seen as the top issue there. Um, next one down, monitoring device behavior. In, in all environments, you can't necessarily install security agents. Um, at times, the you'll, monitoring will be your, your primary means of watching over a device rather than putting software on the device to maintain security. So it might be a primary mechanism, it might be a supplemental mechanism, but either way, being able to watch for anomalies that are outside of the normal, is this device now going to be starting to communicate with uh, a destination that it normally doesn't or starting to send a lot more data to that destination. Device authentication, not surprisingly, once you discover it and have the ability to start managing it, being able to authenticate it to the proper level of security also is super important. So that one came in third on the list. Confidentiality came in next. Um, again, not a surprise that it's not at the top because depending on the environment, you might have worries. But I will point out that integrity, uh, as mentioned earlier, is an important quality that perhaps gets overlooked at times. And then lastly, and this was the surprising one, delivery of patches and updates to devices. So if you think back to that last slide, the top threat was malware insertion, yet, all the way down at fifth on the list is the mechanism that would actually prevent against that, which is a secure mechanism for patches and updates. So there's clearly a bit of a mismatch going on between the threat and how uh, mechanisms and IoT security capabilities are being deployed today from a priority perspective. So let's talk a little bit about where PKI can help. Um, that's what we're here to talk about. Uh, the purpose of this slide is really just to point out that uh, IoT devices are not one size fits all. They come in many shapes and forms. Um, and although people might want to always have the strongest forms of authentication and key exchange and all the other good things PKI can do, uh, certain capabilities using PKI and digital certificates with RSA 2048 or 4096, for example, just won't always work on certain devices that have very constrained power, constrained processing ability, constrained memory right on down the line. So you have to think in terms of a range of device types of IoT and making sure uh, applying the level of mechanism that meets your security requirements, but also fits the device itself. Maybe PKI with, with RSA is, is a good fit. Um, a lot of environments are migrating to use PKI with elliptic curve crypto because you can get the same strength as RSA, but with much shorter 
key lengths, much shorter certificates, a um, little bit easier to handle for certain devices down the line in terms of capability. But other devices might have very limited uh, ability to do authentication and down to the most simple mechanisms or none at all. So uh, you really need to be aware of your environment and be aware of your device type. And if the device doesn't have so much ability, think about what you can build around it to help build that up. It was interesting though to find out in that same survey I mentioned a couple minutes ago that people feel that almost half of all IoT devices will primarily rely on digital certificates. So that's a really strong vote that certificates have a very important role to play going forward. A lot of enterprises have been using PKI and digital certificates for many years for other types of applications. Some of those same learnings applied though into the IoT can be important. So I'm gonna click down into a few other areas to highlight um, three areas where PKI can be a key enabler. So one of them is a hardware root of trust. We talked earlier about that device manufacturing use case where you load in keys and certificates at the time a device is manufactured right there on, on the operating line. And then also um, an end user, once they receive that device and put it into operation, wanna be able to rely on that first step having happened, but then put their own certificates onto the device and start to control it from the time that they've got it on their network. So that's an important place where PKI can play. Uh, you need to have a, a PKI that can issue and then manage all the certificates. Um, you wanna use hardware security modules if you've got an environment where trust is important and you want the generation of those keys and the signing of those certificates to be performed in a really safe place, a high assurance place. And then of course you have to be able to, to manage the device on an ongoing basis. So somewhere in your system there has to be some software that'll take control of the device and manage its security longer term. Patches and updates are so important, as, as mentioned earlier. The ability, uh, there, is, there is no perfect piece of software. software. Software vulnerabilities are like death and taxes, they are inevitable. So the ability to have a secure patching process is really important. The easiest way to get a piece of malware onto an IoT device is to disguise it as a software update or a patch. The second easiest way to get something on there is if it's using signing is to compromise the private key that the source is using to sign that update. If you've, if you've got a hold of that, of that private key, you can put a perfectly legitimate signature over a piece of malware. So really important, uh, A, to have a, a signing process that your IoT device can verify um, when, when it gets a, a proposed software update but also that your source protects the private signing keys. We find a lot of times that people pay great deal attention to protection of encryption keys, but often forget the importance of signing keys and signing keys can be just as dangerous to lose. Another bit on the IoT side to remember is it's really important to know all the different pieces that your developers have used, all the different pieces of software that go into that uh, IoT and run on that IoT device, you know, much like a recipe for a for a, a good meal. Um, you need to know what's in it. So if a vulnerability comes up in one of those pieces that you know that you need an update. And then data protection is another really important leg. Protecting sensitive data coming off IoT devices. Again, it's, it's your whole project of collecting all this data and all the trouble you go to isn't worth a lot if you cannot trust that data. And it's all about protecting anything that's secret and protecting the integrity of it. If it's a weather center collecting data, you think, well, the weather isn't uh, particularly secret, but if it's for an insurance claim, you need to have uh, integrity that the record that you collected is from the exact date and time that, of the accident, perhaps it's being investigated. So you have to think about that. You have to think about all the different hot points for the data as it gets collected through the system and aggregated. Some might be stored at the edge, some might be in the cloud. Um, how do you, handle that end-to-end -end protection and make sure the data is A, protected, but B, accessible. Uh, key management gets really difficult when you get to the scale of thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices, managing all the keys that are needed for that. Um, we do have a guide from Entrust called Key Management for Dummies that illustrates all the life cycles of a key and can help you work through the complications of, of how to manage so many keys over so much of an amount of time in terms of choosing algorithms, best practices for backup, 
um, and how you can avoid getting yourself into trouble by using too few keys for too much data. And of course, an IoT platform, this was a useful um, breakout that, that I found from IoT analytics. When you think about all the security mechanisms I just talked about, uh, where does all that security stuff fit in? Well, it fits in at the device management level, as you see here in the database level. So IoT platforms are the place where all this data is coming in and it's being processed and analyzed and visualized. Really important to that your platform of choice has the, the ability to plug in security offerings that help enable you to do authentication, data protection, uh, software update integrity, and store your data securely. So that was the reason I included that here. So going forward, the top trends driving deployment of applications using PKI, guess what? Number one is the IoT. So PKI has been in use for years, helping you do VPN, SSL, email, all sorts of security. The newest application that is really driving um, PKI uptake is the, in fact the IoT. This is a little sneak preview and Trust will be releasing results of the 2021 Global PKI and IoT Trends Study a week from today on November 10th. So please uh, check that out if you're interested in some more about PKI and some of the influence into the IoT. Most important PKI capabilities for the IoT? Well, scalability. You know, we've talked about the, the need for large scale deployment, millions of devices. Um, when people are in this study, and again, this is a sneak preview from the study that'll be released next week, Everybody is thinking in terms of how do I do this at a very scalable level? I know PKI hasn't always been the easiest thing to manage for applications at a smaller scale. Now I've got to think big. So I've got to think about automation. I've got to think about wide, wide scale life cycle management of certificates and devices. Revocation has always been a really tough problem to solve in the enterprise. A, a third of enterprises have never really gotten their handle around certificate revocation. Well, how do you handle it when it gets to the large scale of the IoT? Um, are, are there ways you can minimize that problem by issuing shorter lived certificates in volume that just get cycled through so you lessen the, uh, the need for a revocation infrastructure? But how is that handled in your environment? That's a really important thing to start strategizing on. How do you start to support lighter weight crypto so more of your IoT devices can be enabled for digital certificates, which clearly a lot of people are looking for? Cloud deployment model is getting much more uh, interest now for PKI because of the need for scale and resilience um, and speed and all the other things that are gonna come along with it. PKI has often been something held a little closer to the enterprise, uh, but there's a lot of advantages to going outside when you can get a, a policy model and a security model that fits what you need from your enterprise perspective. Always wanna have a high assurance PKI if it is the trust infrastructure for your IoT deployment. So that means FIP certified HSMs, backing up the, the, the issuing CAs and the offline root CAs of your, of your PKI. And then finally, that signing infrastructure, again, PKI-based, to be able to sign device firmware is critical for long-term security. Real quickly, because we get a lot of questions about it, alternate crypto post-quantum post is a very hot topic today. Um, it is coming, it is coming fairly soon. Um, it isn't just as simple as a crypto refresh. So it is really something, especially if you are in an environment uh, where you have a lot of sensitive data, you have a lot of compliance requirements. It is exactly the time now to start figuring out your timeline for migration to post-quantum crypto. It can take a number of years. Um, you need to think about data that's being protected today with today's public key algorithms that might be harvested for use in the future. Uh, really important that um, any vendor you're working with on the crypto front has plans and roadmaps and an ability to help you get started in terms of what you need to do to assess your crypto estate overall. Uh, I included a clip from something we have um, on the Entrust website. We have a lot of resources on our blog in particular that talk about this as well as in our, in our PKI area. So some key takeaways as I head towards the wrap up here. Uh, PKI really is a critical enabler for the IoT. It, it's clear that it is the next Big application, a lot of enterprises are using PKI across six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10 or more applications. IoT is showing up as the next big driver. Um, the, the thing you gotta think about there is a lot of organizations have uh, continued to struggle with PKI best practices. Skilled resources are very hard to come by. 
um, today. And um, for that, there's a lot of information out there about PKI best practices, but more and more organizations are challenged to implement them because of skill and resource constraints. So um, if you couple that with some of the scale availability and resilience requirements um, that come along with the IoT, it really um, says, go look at other models, look at hosted, managed as a service PKI models. If they can meet your security needs, what we find a lot of times is organizations will have better luck meeting their security and policy requirements by going to a PKI expert, as opposed to trying to do it in-house now when they don't have the right resources for it. So that's a very strong consideration, especially once you couple it with the performance and resilience requirements as well. And then finally on the IoT front, build security into the POCs. It isn't always the sexiest thing to demonstrate, but it's the thing that needs to be built in from the start in order for the project to have a good chance of success in the future. Uh, we continue to see and hear stories of, of POCs that fail or operational segment when they get to that next level of going into operation, they're not ready for it because they haven't, they haven't got their, their security base in place. They don't have it properly tuned to the threat environment. That mismatch I talked about earlier between if, if malware is seen as the big threat, but yet signing, code signing for firmware updates is really low on your list, you haven't matched up your threat and your mechanism. So you need to get those in tune um, as, as they deal with, as they uh, map into your environment. As a wrap up, Entrust has a lot of tools to bring to bear in this area uh, from PKI and certificate management to hardware security modules for trusted crypto, to authentication, to signing, to data protection and key management. So, as well as some additional specialized tools, particularly around the IoT to pull it all together. So please take a look at us um, if you have interest and need in some of these areas. And with that, I'll wrap it up. And I really wanna thank you for attending this session and thank you uh, for coming to the Encryption Consulting Conference this year.